Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 23rd of the second month on our Creator's calendar, which is the 4th of May, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar. And sorry, I had to make sure it was 2024. Sometimes I forget I'm, I'm 42 years old. <clears throat> uh, it, it it sometimes does surprise me. I don't. I know that might seem a little weird, but it, it's good to feel great. It's good to be in health, right? Anyways, we're gathered today and we're fellowshipping again. We are continuing in Bereshit or the book of Genesis, chapter thirty-seven. If you remember the week before last, we went through the genealogy of Esau, which it might seem a little out of place. For the narrative, it's kind of going through the story of what they're they're doing, and all of a sudden you just have a list of names of people that not are not entirely relevant to the main storyline. But there is a purpose for everything in Scripture. So, ob willing, as we go along, that will become more clear. But before this time, you had Jacob coming back into the land. He had to make restitution with his uncle Laban and then he appeased and made tribute with his brother Esau afterwards it mentions that his sister was or his daughter Dina was defiled rather and now after it showed Esau's genealogies and who was chief and king before any sons of Yahusuf were kings in the land it goes into the story of what happened to Yahusuf when he was 17 what isn't mentioned here is there's a lot of history between when he returned and that stuff that was going on and then right now that we don't quite get just from the narrative here. When you look into the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Book of Jubilees or Yobelim, and the like that were all found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, you get a fuller picture with more than one witness of the things and events that are going on that are in line nothing's disagreeable with anything in scripture and it actually it actually helps fill in the blanks for things that you might see that does not make sense to you for an example yahusuf was given a double portion the birthright baraka over his brothers and the double portion was specifically allotted from what Yahusuf himself had obtained through the use of his bow. You, and we'll read about that eventually here in Bereshit in a few chapters, but you don't find the narrative anywhere in the events that we're going through. It just does not exist. In Yobelim and the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, you have the record of them, however. And that's where you have three witnesses that all go in line something from the original covenant writings a, f a foretelling that he gave and a fact of something stated that he did that's nowhere else mentioned right and then the actual narrative ac accounts of those things happening in other places one for example the battles that they fought are mostly narrated in the testament of yahuda who got the kingship if you will and then the uh book of yobelim covers a summary of those things as well <clears throat> but back on track here <clears throat> this is bereshit or genesis chapter 37 it says why yeshuv right and he dwelt yaakov in the land of his sojourning right of his father's in the land of Canaan. It says, These Toledot Yaakov, or these are the generations, or the ones brought forth, if you will. Remember that Lamed Dalit is where we get the word lad in English today. They just drop the Yod for Yalad, and that means to bring forth or to begot. But it says, And these are the generations of Yaakov. Yahusuf, Ben, the son, is 17 or 7 and 10 years 
right? When he was 17, he was feeding with his brothers, the flocks, and was the boy with the sons of Bilhah. And you remember Bilhah, I believe she was the um, the servant of Ribka or, or uh, Rachel, Rachel, and she bore Dan and Gad. I may be mistaken on that. It could be Dan and someone else, but the sons of Bilhah, okay, and the sons of Zilpha, wives of his fathers, and brought Yahusa for a report or de, of them, right? Debrat. Dib bat tam. So debar is a word matter or thing. The tau makes it past or sorry, and tem is them, but the tau also makes a thing past tense. All right. So he brought a bad report, Ra, right, of them to his father. And Yisrael loved at Yahusuf. Makol Beniu, right? More than all his sons. Because this is the son of his old age, and he was unto him. And that would have been before. No, that would have been after the birth of Benjamin. But he had loved Yahusuf more because he was the son of his old age, and he was that way for a, a few years there. Remember, it was um, Yahusuf was the last one born in the land of Syria or Armenia before they came back into the land. And Benjamin, or Benjamin, if you will, the son of his old age or the son of his right hand, depending on the translation, was um, born in the land. <clears throat> says, and he made him a robe of many colors. They say pasim. They call it flat of hand or foot. And they say very colored three times. You, you can make up the, how, how that is what it is. We probably have to dig a little more. But a robe that is very colored, all right? And... Or it says, but when saw, right, and he saw him, his brothers, that Etu, right, with him loved their father more than all his brothers, then they hated Eth him, Aleph Tau Wa, right? And not could speak to him peaceably, like unto Shalom. And had, it says, Waya Khalam, to be healthy or strong, but that Khalam is also a dream. All right? See? Khalim, right? And he dreamed Yahusuf a dream, and he told it, right? And he declared unto his brothers, and even more they hated him, right? Ode. That word is going around, continuing still yet again, beside Eric Bissell in his in his um, Paleo Hebrew videos, Erictology. And he says it's again and again repetitive, boom, 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 boom. Right? That's how one way that he goes over that. But they hated him even more because of the dream that he had had. Right? <clears throat> and says. And he said to them, Hear him now. The dream this which I have dreamed, and there we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, a rose. Remember, I, I had mentioned that that word comb, like the rooster's comb, means to stand, rise, or rose. So Kuma is the fact of rising or arose. It's the hay 
seeing it being done or it's, it's visibly appearing. That's how the hey is affected in a word. It's like the definite article when you put it beforehand, but it's revealing or making evident a thing. And then literally in the Paleo Hebrew, it's like a backwards E, if you will, kind of slanted down. It's like the rays of light through a window, what's revealing something. Even in the English, when it's turned around and uses an E, it's in the, and it kind of has the same phenomenon if you if you look at how it's used in words, but we've really lost that function completely in its use in the English language, just so you know. This is, and behold, arose my sheaf, wagem, and with them it stood upright, and indeed, gem is with, more also over, yea, sorry. There you go. It says, and also stood upright, and Hana, and behold, it says, stood all around your sheaves, and bowed down to my sheaf. So he's basically saying that their sheaves were submitting to his. And said he unto, or to him, his brothers, Shall indeed your you reign? That's Tamalak or Tamlek or Timlok, they call it, sorry, Timlok. But they put the Tau before the Melek, and that makes it past tense. Shall reign, right? Ha Melok, Hamalok, Timlok, right? He says, shall indeed, remember they put a hey right here, two ways it can be used, just so you know, and this is for anyone that's not familiar. When you have it before a sentence, it can be a question, like this one is Hamelech or Hamelok, Timlok, right? They're saying, shall you reign over us? Another one is in Genesis, we previously that we've already covered, where Cain, when he's confronted by Yahuwah, he says, am I my brother's keeper? It has a hey before literally, I am my brother's keeper. It, that makes it a question. So it's the definite article. And you can always tell when it means the, and it's pointing out like the man, because it will have all the verbs following it also have a hey. It will, it will share the same article as the the verb or the uh, noun that they are attached to if you will <clears throat> it might be other you know it might be the adverbs and adjectives that also have it i'm not exactly sure but it's a phenomenon that you can see anytime you look in the hebrew when you open a stone's tanakh for example or any of the masoretic texts or you look at, at this long enough too and as you can see right here when it's a question there are no more haze in front of the other words. So that makes it the distinction, usually, how you can tell the difference for how it's being used. At least that's what I've been gathering as I learn. I am by no means an expert yet. Just so you guys are know, or you're aware, I've been studying the Hebrew for a few years now, but I don't fluently speak it, and I wouldn't call myself an expert in, in anything. I look at the dictionary every time. <clears throat> but he says, or indeed shall you have dominion over us, right? And this is to reign or to rule, Mishal. When you add uh, Yod at the end, it's Mishli, and that's the word for Proverbs. So my reign is to know Proverbs and riddles. Something that kings and others who have that time seek to do, right? So even more, or owed, again they hated him. For his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed still dream another and told it to his brothers and said, behold... I have dreamed a dream again, or another one, 
and this time, or and behold, Hashemesh, the sun, Waha Yirach, right, and the moon, Wa Achad, and one ten of the stars, right? So, and eleven of the stars, sorry, one and ten, <clears throat> bow down to me. Now, this one is important, all right? The sun, the moon, and the stars, the description here is, is given as Yaakov, his mother, and his brothers, okay? The 12 being related to not, not a star, but stars, and that would be the 12 constellations, as we call it, or the zodiac signs. The 12 emissaries are also equated or related to them, in the coming of our Mashiach, who is like the sun, and came preaching the kingdom, that is like the moon. So there's that picture again. But um, you can see this is the first reference of that in any capacity, where you have the moon given the reference of the mother. And if you remember, a mother is like a metropolis or a city already previously established generations ago from before their times after the flood when you had Shem, Ham, and Yepheth named the first cities they built after their wives. I'm not exactly sure if we've ever mentioned it before on here or not, but when you look up in the Hebrew the word for um, a, a woman or a city, it's actually the same word, or, or sorry, metropolis is the word for mother. So there's an inherent meaning there because of that very thing. But the the moon being related to the kingdom, or the Shemaim Yarushalayim, which are Mashiach, who is like the bridegroom and the son that came preaching, is what we go over in detail in Gad the Seer chapter 1. This is the first reference to that, which is why I was pointing out again. <clears throat> But, and it says, and they bowed down to me. So he told to his father and his brothers, and he rebuked him, right, his father. And he said unto him, what? The dream this that you have dreamed, you know, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall indeed, there's that hey again, right? Shall this dream come, Nabo? I and your mother and your brothers to bow down before you to the ground? And envied, but that waye kaneu, right? We can nu, we can you, they say, we can u, but that way is a diphthong, and it's and he was jealous of him. That word kanah is like, he, I am a jealous L, what he says in the third commandment. They put it as envy here, but it he's jealous or zealous, depending on the context. And they're jealous of him, his brothers, but his father kept Shema et Hadabar, the matter, right? Wayelek, wayeleku, Right, and he went, or and he went him, his brothers to feed or to shepherd, eth the flock of his father, in Shechem, and said, or and he said, Yisrael to Yahusuf, are not your brothers pasturing in Shechem? Again, you can see that hey, okay, and. You can also know when it's a question because the Masoretic text will denote it with a half vowel underneath it of some kind. So it doesn't make a full vowel sound. It, in contrast, when you have the definite article, you can see ha and then halom. That is the path act that's a long vowel it won't always be a path act but it'll always be a long vowel and that means the you see a is dream 
but this is literally what the dream this that you've dreamed, right? So just for context there. It says, are not your brothers pasturing in Shechem? Come and I will send you. And I is Aleph, right? Shalak is a scent and then cough is you so and i will send you all one word right here in the hebrew elihem unto them wa yeomer lu and he said to him here i am and he said to him go now remember this is the word now in english they translated as please but it says go now and see f shalom see with shalom or if it is well with your brothers and eth shalom with the flocks okay and hashuvni right and he will return to me and bring back to me debar or word the matter or thing and so he sent him out of the valley of hebron and he went to Shechem, and he found a certain man, right? Wayad Matsu, right? And he found him an Ish, and this Ish or Enosh, they have that as Enosh here. That's interesting. This says Ish, but when I clicked on that, that says Enosh, and that's the word. Enosh is a different word. They actually have that as the name of a man, but that's like mortal or infirm. <clears throat> now I'm curious if that's actually Enosh in a regular Hebrew verse or not. Just give me one moment. We're going to pause real quick. All right, so we just checked the Leningrad Codex there on my phone, and it does say Ish as well. So I don't know why it's coming back as Enosh here when you click on the link. But Ish just means man. Enosh, Enoshi, right? It means man too, but in the sense of mortal or frail. And that was the son of Seth, if you recall. This, however, is not a, a, a mortal or infirm man as we're about to see this is actually our mashiach i believe letting him know where he's at but it's just a man that he finds along in the way that helps him right this is and found him ish a man and behold wandering in the field this is to air in the field So because Yahusuf didn't know where to find them, he was erring and ran into this man. And he asked the man, saying, What are you seeking? So he said, Eth my brothers, I am seeking. All right? Tell me now where they are pasturing. This is like the word ra'a for shepherd or pastor or tending for grazing. And then the M, or the M, I'm sorry, the name, the, where we get our mem, the letter M, right? That is the, that's the plural for them. It's where they're pasturing, right? That just, the yod mem pluralizes it. Sorry, this is where they are pasturing. It says, and they said, and said the man, they have departed from this place, or from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dotham. And so went, or, and he went, Yahusuf, Acher, after his brothers, and found them in Dotham. Now, when they saw him, Aleph Tawa, right, eth him, afar off, and even before he came near unto them, 
Then they conspired against him or with him to kill him. Right? And it was moot to die. This is literally lahamitu. This is unto the killing of the, the yod is the working hand. It's the doing of a thing. And the mem tau is death. So it's unto the, the killing of him. You can see it in the very language itself there, right? And he said the man to another, right? One man to another. Look. The all dreamer, the all halomot lahmot. This is the Lord of dreams, they call him. So they're mocking him here. Th this one is coming. Therefore, come and let us kill him. Or let us slay him. And cast him into one of the pits. And we shall say a beast a wild beast right or a beast of the field or a beast of the a bad evil sorry they put wild there but an evil beast has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams now in the book of yobelim it mentions that these pits that they're talking about were wells that were dug by their father that never produced water because our father knew in advance that these things would happen and left it dry for Yahusuf to be cast into. And that's the um, everything working for the benefit of those who love Elohim and to those who are called according to purpose. While he's digging a well and not getting water, I'm sure he didn't think that this was something for his good. It was for his benefit and to the best, but... We can look at it 2020 and see, yeah, indeed, that was the very thing. And that helps us to trust in our situation, the things going on that we don't see necessarily as the best it could be for us in a different light, Father willing. But he does things like that all the time, where our expectations are not always met, but everything literally works out for our best, <clears throat> whether we know it or not. says, but heard Reuben, right? Well, and when he heard Reuben, he rescued him. This is literally to rescue, export, deliver, to like fling out. This is what it says that he delivered or exported, right? The children out of the land of Egypt. But we'll get to that. He says, and he delivered them out of their hands, from the hands of them, okay? And he said, don't let us take soul, right? Let us not, neku, right, to smite his soul. And he said to them, Reuben, not to shed blood, that's that damn Remember when I said Adam is I will bleed or I am, it's also the word for red, but just damn by itself is blood. It's not shed blood, but cast him into a pit, this pit, which in the wilderness, or is in the wilderness, right? The Midbar. That's also the name of the book Numbers, but it literally means in the wilderness. And... A hand not do lay on him. So do not lay a hand on him that he may deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So he intended to have them put him in the pit so that he can later restore him to his father and perhaps make amends for the things that he had done. Remember, he was already in dishonor and a state of penitence. So he didn't want to do any more to uh, cause problems for himself. So it came to pass when had come Yahusuf to his brothers that they stripped, excuse me, that they stripped um, Eth Yahusuf, Eth of his robe, Eth the robe 
of varied colors, right? That was on him. And you can see all of these have the Aleph Tau before them. There is a place marker there for significance, for a purpose. Yes, our brother made a comment in the chat here. It says, the testaments of the patriarchs give great detail on how the brothers felt about Yahusuf and how Yahuwah delivered him from the hands of his brothers because he was righteous. Also, the messengers of repentance and of envy and hatred, they all had towards Yahusuf. Absolutely. It goes into some of the greatest detail about themes that you find not until you or you get really into the renewed covenant times, but the two ways, the um, the influences of how root inner beings or demons influence your inner being and how you have the choice and liberty of will to accomplish the thing that, that you desire in your heart, right? Great detail in those things. Yahuda and his failures and with women and alcohol and how they his children would be plagued because of it. Um, Reuben in his sufferings for what he had gone through and to have, be steadfast and be careful about uh, the waywardness of seduction. I believe Asher talked about the two ways of everything. Dan goes into the, the things about anger, right? I think Gad mentions being strong and having courage, but also learning to be compassionate and not just hard. So there, there's a lot of great stuff in there that you really, it's tragic because if you read most of what was said about it in commentaries, they say there's a lot of Christian interpolations because of the themes throughout the entirety of those texts. Uh, there's so much that are related to what we can find in the Renewed Covenant writings that they think that it was just added later on. But these are revelations that were given to them that they knew and passed down to their children in Mitzrayim that they lost or that they perverted within only 215 years. So something to keep in mind. <clears throat> but let's go ahead and continue. I, for anyone that's interested, we highly recommend reading the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, which we will cover in the course of time shortly uh, as we get to them. This is uh, Yahi, the same thing that in the beginning, right? And it came to be, or so it came to pass. It says when, but as that, or as which, like which is literally what that means who which or that so to be like which is when if that makes sense i know that seems a little convoluted but that's how the hebrew functions they, they don't actually have all these different words for things but it's like that thing and you get the context um and the uses of those change too so this could be as happy same spelling, exact same thing, just different. Be It would be um, pronounced differently, right? But it says, So it came to pass when had come Yahusuf to his brothers that they'd stripped eth Yahusuf eth of his robe, eth the robe of varied colors. That or which was upon him. And they took and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty with no ein in it, nothing in it of water, okay? And they sat down to eat a meal, and they lifted their eyes and look, and there was a company of Yishmaelim coming. And that's that bow, hey. So the, the bow is to come, right? <clears throat> I'm sorry. We just had that right over here. Had come. And then you see where the hay is here. It is now coming. It says, from Gilad, with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh, on their way to carry down to Mitzrayim, or to Egypt. So said Yahuda 
to his brothers, what profit if we kill him, right? Eth our, or sorry, if we kill Eth our brother and conceal Eth his blood. Remember, so it's killing him and concealing his blood. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelim and our hand not let it be upon him. For our brother is our flesh, right? And he is. And they listened to him, his brothers. Now that saved him from being killed, but he was sold into slavery contrary to what Reuben wanted, who was not there at the time. And then you can see he had a similar idea to do what Reuben did, but it was changed. While he sold him into slavery, Yahuda, remember, the one who's getting the kingdom, he's also the one that is later the kinsman redeemer. Okay? An important thing to keep in mind for how things play out for our purposes. The fact that Yahushua came through the line of Yahuda was because of that. And the same thing with the willingness to serve obediently that came from Louis that came from Abraham, and that was what the kahuna was given. Those kind of pictures are what were typified in the coming of our Mashiach, right? But you see that more clearly when you get through the books of Yobelim and these other ones as well. He says, so said Yahudu to his brothers, what profit is if we kill our, Eth our brother and conceal Eth his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelim and our hand not let it be upon him. For our brother our, is our flesh, right? And he, or sorry, he is. So our brother is, he is our flesh. That's how they put that in English, sorry. <clears throat> the Hebrew often has the, the noun or something backwards from what we would have it in English because it was right to left, or and we read from left to right. So it, it's literally backwards. It says, and he listened his brothers and passed men the Midianite traitors. So they pulled up and lifted up Eth Yahusuf out of the pit and sold Eth Yahusuf to the Ishmaelim. The Ishmaelim are called Midianites right here. Just for context to who Moshe went to and got married, right? We sold them to the Ishmaelim for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Eth Yahusuf to Mitzrayim or to Egypt. Then returned Reuben to the pit, and indeed, or and behold, Ein Yahusuf, there was, Yahusuf was not, right, in the pit. And he tore Eth his clothes. This is something that you see quite often in the original covenant times where they'll tear their garments and, and petition the maker. That bet gimel dalet is just like the aleph bet gimel dalet is the first four letters. It literally means aleph bet gimel dalet is the natural order of things. It is the meaning of that word, right? The, the right course of events. But as a word, just bet gimel dalet, it means clothing. Very interesting word. It's also treachery to deceive, to act or deal treacherously, right? Spoil is bag, but baguette here, we get to another one. There's treachery, and then you can see a garment or covering, baguette. So to tear your garments and petition to make to humble yourself is to, to tear apart your treachery to stop being deceiving, right? To rip that apart and then come to him humbly. That's a picture for that kind of thing. I just wanted to point out that in particular. But this is where we get the word in English for baggy, like baggy clothing. It's deceptive while it's a garment and a covering. It's also treacherous or deceptive because it's camouflage or it's baggy. You can't see what you look like underneath it. It hides your your form. And that's kind of like how he came. I bet Gimel Dalit. 
I came hidden, which is exactly what our Mashiach did, who is the living word from the bosom of the Father, we'd call the Aleph Bet or the, the Yahudith or Hebrew language, right? That's part of that. I wanted to point that out as we got there. So very awesome word, very interesting to look into. Also encourage that whenever you guys get the time. But back on track here, it says, and he returned to his brothers and said, Ha Yelad, right? The boy no more. I knew, right? And I, where, where shall I go? Right? Yeah, Reuben's saying, the boy is no more. And, and where, what, what should I do? Because he's already been dishonored once to his father. And now he has to return with this shame. So they took at the robe of Yahusuf and killed a kid. It, this is a Sa'ir, right? Sa'ir, kind of like where Esau went, but Mount Sa'ir, and it means hairy. So he killed a hairy one. It doesn't say a kid, but it said he killed a hairy one of the goats, a female goat. A kid is literally a child. It's a baby goat, and that's a different word. It's giddy. It's where we get the word kid in English, which is why our brother Earl is very adamant not to use that when he's talking about his children, because that's where that word came from. It's the kids from Hebrew. But anyways, that isn't that. This is a female goat that's hairy. This is, and they killed the hairy goat and dipped at the robe in the blood. And they sent at the robe of many colors or of varied colors. And they brought it to El, their father. And he said to him, This we have found, Hekor, or Hekor, to regard or recognize. That might be close to like pointer discern. Remember in the Hebrew, or not Hebrew, in the Old English, you have that word hearken. And that's literally to regard or to, to bend the attention toward. I believe that might be the, the related word right here. Harkar, right? Harkin is what we say in the English there. And that would have replaced, if you remember, the word for Shema in its usage, to listen. But it said, this we have found. Do you know now the robe of your son? It, or if, whether, this is it, right? Or no. And he recognized it and said, the robe of my son, an evil beast or a beast that is evil, has devoured him. Without doubt, is torn to pieces, Yahusuf, and tore Yaakov his clothes, and put, this is a different word, Shalamati, that is Shem Latu, Lata, right? But this is a different, a wrapper or mantle. It is his clothing, but it's not the same thing for deception or treachery. <clears throat> as a side, as a as an inherent word with a different meaning with the same spelling anyways, right? This is any Tor Yaakov, his clothes or his mantle and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son, Yamim Rabim, that is days much or many, very many days. It says that he mourned for him an entire year in the book of Yobelim. And this happened on the 10th of the ninth month where it actually came in the evening of the ninth before where they brought the bad news and the 10th was the first day that Yaakov was mourning the death of his son and he mourned for an entire year and so we represent a year for a day there by keeping the day of atonement in perpetuity Another thing that is mentioned in um, the book of Yobelim, specifically this account being on that day, 
And then the fact that it is to continue forever, you can see another witness in the book of Gad the seer. Well, you have Yikra, right? Leviticus, which says these are perpetual, but you also have Gad the seer, where the vision that Gad receives on the first of the seventh month of what happens where the three books are opened before the Father every year. And our Mashiach reads in them the deeds of the righteous, the deeds of the unintentional sinners, and then the, the list of the wicked. And he goes over the first are his, they shall live forever. The second we'll put off to the side and we'll see what they do. Now, please keep in mind, the first are his, and they shall live forever. Not, I'm going to cause them desolation for a time and then restore them to their body, but they will never die. That's exactly what happened to Hanok, Eliyahu, Baruch, Ezra, and everyone like them. They're living in paradise today, and it's exactly what our Mashiach said. Everyone who is living and believing in me shall never taste death at all. Do you believe this? He further went on, and <clears throat> you can see when he returns, that there will be a multitude of men that will not die, but will be changed like the messengers, and the second death will have no power over them. They are not ones risen from the dead, but they are ones that will never die. And they will have that exact same condition. This is the generations to come that we need to train into obedience. We're just like Abraham. It took a few generations and boom. Same patterns, same echoes. If you can see them, it, it helps us with what we have to do. But coming back to the truth is primarily our concern. And if you've done something that deserves a death sentence as by his word, it's part of counting the cost of being a believer. You got Everyone's going to pay the price for it, right? Everyone will pay the price for their inequities. It's whether or not you do it in this life or in the age to come. Much more preferably now, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, and arose all his sons and all his daughters to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, or and he said, for I shall go down to my son in mourning. Abel, right? This is Abel or um, Job, if you, if you remember Job, right? In mourning, he changed his name. It's very similar to that one, though, but he had a yod in front of it, but he's mourning. It was Yob. But I will go down mourning into the grave. Thus wept for him his father. And I don't believe it's mentioned here, but during this time, Dina passed away and Bilhah passed away in mourning for Yahusa. So he lost three within a month, I believe, and that's when he had mourned for a year. And the Midianites had sold him in Mitzrayim, or Egypt, to Pontifar, unto Pontifar, an officer of Pharaoh, prince, or captain of the guard. This right here is an addition they put at the end of chapters or whatever you want to call it. It was not originally in the text, and it doesn't mean anything, just so you're aware. Uh, we still got a little bit of time. So this is Yahuda and Tamar. Like Again, it doesn't go into any detail about when the children of Yaakov or Yisrael got married, who they married and what happened in regard to that. Although those events are mentioned in other places, some in greater detail than others. But <clears throat> we'll keep going. The fact that he is married, you can plainly see. How it happened is mentioned elsewhere. The facts that you have different things that are not disagreeing with one another, but congruent 
those are the important things to look for. You'll find, as an example, in the book of Jasher or Yashar, they call it Jasher today. I don't consider these ones to be legitimate. Any of them that are in publication, like what's in the Sefer, the Eth Sefer, is not scripture. Those books, none of them were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And while that isn't a fail safe, like, oh, that must mean it's not as an absolute proof, it's a very good indication that it wasn't there. The book of Esther wasn't there either, but it is scripture, just for clarity's sake. And even the editions of Esther in the Greek should be part of that, which include his name and have dreams of, of showing what would be happening to his servants before it does, inclining with the truth that you can read all throughout scripture as well. But point being, um, you miss out on that. What happens with Yahuda and Tamar and with his and with his wife, he goes over in more detail in his testament. So if you're interested, I would recommend you checking that out as well. It says, and it came to pass in that time that he came down Yahuda from his brothers. It says departed, but that's Yerod, just like Jared or the patriarch and the Jordan or the Yarden River is to come down from Dan. And he came down Yahuda Ma'eth from his brothers and settled Eth near a man, Adulamin, an, an Adulamite, right? So he's an Adulamite from the sons of Canaan or from the sons of uh, Yishmael, rather, I think. And his name was Chaira, yeah, Chaira. And he saw there Yahuda, a daughter of a certain Canaanim, whose name is Shua. And he married her and went in to her. So she conceived and bore, and <clears throat> you don't get the context here, but in the book of Yobelim, Abraham was received the language of creation. Our Mashiach made himself known to him after the language had been taken from the mouths of everyone and the minds of all men at the Tower of Babel. This was the fourth generation after, third or fourth, depending on how you look at it. And he was given it back after he repented. He was also given the writings that Noah had and had passed down to Shem. These he transcribed. And in the process of that, he learned about the history of what had happened and how the sons of Noah split up the land and Canaan broke the oath that he swore. And so that all of his children living in that land that belonged to another were literally violators of that covenant and under the ban it, that context is massively huge the implication is obvious but it's completely missing from what we call the bible so you have what seems to be the loving merciful creator of the renewed covenant times telling his children to come through here and commit genocide for no cause or purpose whatsoever Right, And it's a horrible thing. People have a lot of questions. It's caused some to lose belief because of the way these are translated or the way it's written. But when you have the full history of what happened, they were under the ban for violating the covenant they'd made. They broke their vow. And there was no forgiveness of that. As long as they were in the land, they were under the ban and they had to be wiped out or they had to leave. The fact that some Canaanites did leave is known in antiquity there's the whole hittite kingdom in turkey that pre was um <clears throat> they call it a hittite kingdom they were in communication with the people of canaan until they were wiped out by the hebrews and they were contemporary with the, the trojans and others of that time so i don't know or i can't claim to know all the history behind it but the ones that did leave the area we're still alive for a time. It's just the ones that stayed in that land and broke the very word that they said that they would keep. 
they didn't have an expectation. The things that were done or they did were done unto them. And that's why, I'm sorry, that Abraham knew that he refused to have married a Canaanite woman or anything like that. He stayed with his own and he enjoined his son not to do so, who enjoined his son, Jacob, not to do so. But Esau, where you remember, he married Canaanite women. Uh, when he realized that that was displeasing to his father, he married uh, a daughter of Yishmael as well. But you can see here, when Yahuda marries them, the point is everyone that was of the sons of Canaan from the line of male or man or woman was under the ban. And it doesn't matter if a son of Yahuda or Yah Yisrael married into them or not, those children are still Canaanites under the ban in the land there. That um, he did not immediately wipe them out. If you recall, two of the sons died, but one lived, and they were a predominant and very large part of the tribe of Yahuda for a very long time. I'm, I'm hoping you can see why they had issues as a people because of the influence of, of who you know, was in their genes there. I'm not trying to be mean. It's not, we're all in a mess when we think about these things, but this is literally the fact of it. It's how his word established reality. And you can see it if you take the time to pay attention. So I highly encourage everyone to, to think about these things, you know. <clears throat> but there's reasons why Yahuda betrayed him. There's reasons why they've been, they've had issues, ups and downs, and sometimes they do right, sometimes they don't. And there's only particular families and only select ones of the whole multitudes that get things while others don't, right? There's reasons for that. It says, so she conceived and bore a son, and he called Wayakara, right? And he called Eth Shemu, Shemu, right? His name, Ur. Which is to rouse oneself or wake. Right, so this is the rousing of his his firstborn. It was the rousing of his self. He called him, right. And she conceived again and bore a son, and she called Eth his name, Onan. This is vigorous. And she conceived yet again, right? That's that ode, and bore a son. And called at his name Selah. This is a son of Yahuda from Selah, which is to, or Selah to be quiet or at ease. That's that. Um, <clears throat> Selah is used throughout the Psalms when it wants you to pause or meditate, when there's a cessation of the music, if you will. It means to like stop and think about it for a moment. Wa hiya, and he was at Chabez or Chazib, sorry, when she bore him. Eth him, right? And took Yahuda a wife unto Ur. So you can see he not only had a wife himself. But his children are now old enough to have wives themselves. So 20 years at least is covered just in the text right in, in one spell swoop. You got to keep that in mind. Sometimes it's not always one flowing narrative or there's a lot of space between things that we might not always see. But he said, and he took Yahudah a wife for her, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar, which is a palm, a date. Right, Tomer. Tomeris was the queen of the Mazagati as well. She was the queen from the line of Yahuda, from probably from the line of Dawid, over the Masagati or the greater Gati, which was a branch of the Hebrews in dispersion from the northern kingdom. But you can see it means a palm tree or a post, and it's also a date, like the fruit. Yeah. 
it means the tree itself and the fruit that comes from it. <clears throat> it says, Wa Yehi, and it came to be Ur, the firstborn of Yahuda, Ra, is wicked or evil in the eyes of Yahuwah. And he killed him, Yahuwah. Now remember what the twelve had done to Yahusuf. And it was Yahudah's instigation. And now the things that he's done, and now what he reaps in his own children. If you can see the pictures here, everyone getting according to what they deserve, this is what life is all about. This is why I, I try to tell my children, learn from my mistakes and don't, don't do things that cause yourselves problems if at all possible. <laughs> <clears throat> Why, yeah, Omer, says, and he said, Yahuda to Onan, go into the wife of your brother and marry her and raise up an heir and raise up a seed unto your brother. Because that was the Torah, that was the instructions given from before. And he's following what he knew to do, what he thought to be right there, right? But we don't have those instructions anywhere previous to this. You find that um, you find that in the uh, the the Torah that Moshe receives, but you do find the instructions and in, in things given in the book of Yobelim, and you can find a foreshadowing of this, like the fact of being a kinsman redeemer was echoed in Abraham, in how he took his nephew Lot under him and adopted him, if you will. He was kind and benevolent, right? He had a heart for others and to do right by people. It says, and he knew, Onan, that not his would be the heir or the seed, right? That it would be his brothers. And it came to be, Im, when he comes or when he went into the wife of his brother, that he emitted on the ground, right? that he cast on the ground, least he should give an heir to his brother. So um, for anyone, this is like contraception back in the day. And his intent was to not have children so that he wouldn't raise an heir for his brother. But this, pulling out and not having seed when you're we're doing that, our creator calls evil. Kepha goes into more detail about these things, about being chaste and um, you're only coming to your wife for the purposes of procreation. You can't enjoy yourselves. That's the whole point. But the purpose, it is for an intent, right? He goes into more detail with that. But you can see here in the narrative, it playing out in that very way. It says, and displeased in the sight, or, and evil, and he was evil in the eyes of Yahuwah, the thing which he did, excuse me, there you go. therefore, and he killed him also with him, meaning with his brother Ur. And he said, Yahuda to Tamar, unto Tamar, his daughter-in-law, wait or remain should be right whenever i mentioned that before you have the bet the letter b there without the dot in it it makes the v sound they say okay and that was a legitimate use as far as i'm aware you have examples like in the word hebrew or um eber if you will it's over in english but you have um avery aber Eber, Avaris, like the city of the Hebrews, right? And these are B's and V's interchangeably with the same letters. So that is actually a legitimate use that I'm aware of, of the bet and the, the, the V and the B interchanging. The Wa becoming a V is more modern Hebrew. It was never in the classical. It was only after the Babylonian captivity that that became prevalent. And possibly not even before our Mashiach came. It was after that time. 
But either way, <clears throat> he told him to remain a widow in the house of your father until he's grown yigadal, he's great or becomes great, right? It doesn't mean to grow up or become great, yigdal. Gadal is to be great, and migdalim is like the great, the heights or the greatness. It's also the towers. Um, the migdal is a place or the means of growing or being great, which is a tower, just for context there. This is wait until he is grown, Selah, because he was still young, my son. For he said, least he die also, he like his brothers. And went to Mar and dwelt in the house of her father. Now, what's not mentioned here is that Selah was married off to a Canaanite or to a different woman of uh, by his mother later on, and he was very displeased about that. <clears throat> Says, now, La Yirbu. Says, and he or and became much many or great, right? Rabah. But they, they have that as now. And it became great him in the course of time and died the daughter of Shua, the wife of Yahuda. And was confronted Yahuda and went up to the shears or and was comforted. Okay, so yeah, I'm sorry. That reads kind of funny. But and it was in the course of time, his wife died. I had mentioned to you that she actually got Selah to marry another woman. And Yahuda, when he found out about it, he cursed her in his heart and she died. So something to keep in mind. But um, he wanted to be comforted. And so he went up to the shears of his sheep. Who And Hiram, his friend, the Adulamite at Timnah. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, your father-in-law, Hamik, husband's father, okay? But your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her garments of widowhood from her and covered with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the entrance of Enam, Enim, Enaim, that was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that was grown Selah, and she was not given to him as a wife. Now, the context there is the cities of the Amorites and the places where she was at, it was customary for a woman who was betrothed or getting married to go out and be a harlot for a week, and whatever money she acquired was her dowry. <clears throat> That's what she was dressing up to do here. More detail is given in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs about that, what was going on. It says, and when he saw Yahud or her, Yahuda, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. And he turned to her by the way and said, come now, let me come into you. For not that he did not, or for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, what will you give me that you may come into me? And he said, I will send you a young goat. So th this is a giddy, right? And that's where we get the word kid. It's a kid, a young goat. That's literally the word kid in English. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he says, and I will send a young goat of the goats. So a young female goat from the flock. So she said, if only you will give me a pledge until you send it. And he said, what pledge? All right. What pledge that shall I give you? So she said, your signet and cord and your staff. So his girdle, his belt, his ring and his staff, his scepter. What he ruled with, what he girdled, his, his strength and his signet. And he goes into detail about what all that represented with his kingdom. 
but he gave it up to harlotry or to women, which is represented in the monarchies of the world, giving up to the harlot in the dark ages kind of thing. That was what was uh, was foretelling here. But inverse, while this worked to benefit, that kind of stuff was is not so pleasant, right? He says, that is in your hand, and he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. So she arose and rose and went away and laid aside her veil upon and put on the garments of her widowhood and sent Yahuda Eth, the kid of the female goats, by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the hand of the woman, but not did he find her. So he Yahuda sent the Adulamite to go pay the woman, but he couldn't find her, right? And he asked Eth, the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot? She was in E Naim by the roadside. And they said, No, there was in this place no harlot, right? So he returned to Yahuda and said, Lo, I cannot find her. And the men of the place said that there was no harlot in the place. And said Yahuda, let her take of her for herself, lest we be shamed, for I sent the the kid, this, and you have not found her. So, for I've sent this, the kid, and you have not found her to give it. And it came to pass, or and it came to be, about after three months, all right, that's after three chodeshim, was told that Yahuda, saying, has played the harlot, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, and furthermore, behold, she is pregnant by harlotry. So said Yahuda, bring her out and let her be burned. Let her be burned. People might, to burn, saraf, right? That word, what's, in, what's enjoined right here, you don't find that instruction that I'm aware of anywhere in the Torah, but it is in the book of Yobelim. It was in the original writings. And that is the judgment of that harlot that is going to be put on her, burnt up in one day. So that picture was foretold in this very thing of what he enjoined, when, what you were to do to people in adultery. The woman caught in adultery or harlotry was to be burned. The man was also supposed to be killed as well. The instructions are the Torah given by Moshe showed that you had to have both parties and they both had to suffer the consequences which was why our Mashiach did not accuse her he says neither do I accuse you go and sin no more it wasn't because he was breaking the law it was because he was following it and those guys were trying to trip him up but that's something that's overlooked however at this point, he was given the injunction to burn her. And because he was zealous in trying to be obedient to what he knew to be true, it was it was beneficial to him. Okay. <clears throat> it says, so when she was brought out, then she sent to her father-in-law, saying, by the man that Lamed could be by, for, concerning, in regard to, unto, right? It, it means a variety of things, but Laish, right? By the man who these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, determine now to whom the signet and the cord and the staff are, are these, right? How these, that they belong. So acknowledged Yahuda and said, Zadika, right? She's more righteous than I, because upon thus not did I give her to Selah, my son, right? And never again more he knew her. So he was declaring that she was more righteous because he was not able to give Selah to her, 
and she was taking the the child in her own way and while she wasn't going to be burned with fire he was not going to go in under her anymore because that was an illicit thing she was his his daughter-in-law and that wasn't something that was not to be done so he still showed repentance and because of that these children through tamar his only legitimate children were where our mashiach and and dawid came from then these sons Perez and Zera are the reigning families of the line of Yahuda the world over. The sons of Zera in antiquity will cover these things as we get to it. But while they were in the Exodus, while they're in Mitzrayim, if you will, in Egypt, there was sons of Zera sending out colonies of Hebrews that were following with them to go set out city-states. Athens, Troy, the kingdom of Attica, Cat, uh, Calcol, and the, with the Lacedaemonians and the Spartans, all of those were city-states founded by Hebrews that were intermixing with the, the sons of Yahweh there. But later on, when Pharez's line was diminished, if you recall, because of the inequity they had done and the Babylonian captivity, the daughter of Zadik Yahu was brought to the Hermon in Ireland, the largest landholder in Ireland, who was a son of Zerah. And her children were of the line of Dawid from the direct sons of Zerah over the children, continuing the promise given to him where he would always have a son ruling over them perpetually. You would always have a child ruling over them, if you will, because for a time it was it was uh, Te Taffy, which if you want more information about that, the book of Te Taffy is the Irish bard songs. We've read a little bit of them a few weeks ago, but you can find that online. And it is re it's the history of Yahu or Jeremiah bringing her to Ireland. Not uh, I highly recommend you studying it. <clears throat> Of course, you know, I, I recommend all these things. All right, and it says, and it came to pass at, at the time, or in that time, the giving birth, that behold, twins, right? That's that Toma, Toma meme, twins in her womb. And that wasn't the first. This is the echo, if you remember, of the twins with Jacob and Esau. You'll find those kinds of echoes also where Noah was the first to have children late in his life when he was over 500 years old. And then you see that echo of a long time before a child in Abraham, in Yitzhak, in Yaakov, and then later on even in Zakariyahu and his wife echoed many generations later. The idea of these twins and the idea of the birthright covenant going to the second born, passing over the first all of these patterns you see are like ripples in history, like the waters, if you if you can recall that. That's how it plays out, and you can see them, echoes. I call it echoes, like a ripple effect in the waters of, of, of life or of men, right? It, it all plays out the same way, but you can see these patterns the more you look at them. All right, let's finish this up real quick. Sorry about that. This is... And so it was, and it came to be when she was giving birth that they put out the hand and took the midwife and tied on his hand, Shani, it's a scarlet thread representative of the kinsman redeemer coming first, but being the second, right? Um, this picture is explained in detail in the Against Heresies by Irenaeus. But it's saying, this one came out first, and it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, behold, came out his brother. And she said, how have you broken, or that paretza, right, paretza, and you, or upon you, Elika, paretz, that was his name, paretz, right, or Ferez, they call it. And he called, therefore he called Shemu his name Perez or Ferez, right? And afterwards came out his brother, who 
on his hand the scarlet, and he called his name Zerach. To rise or come forth, right? Dawned, arose, broke, risen. And that was to shine. He was the one that was supposed to shine first, the, the risen one, right, with the kinsman or the, the scarlet, but was the second coming. So there's a whole bunch of different pictures there. And again, more details on the parables of that information is in Irenaeus against heresies. He was the taught one of Polycarp, who was the taught one of Yahukanon, contemporary with Ignatius. And afterward came out his brother, uh, who had had on his hand the scarlet, and they called Shemu, his name, Zerah. All right, so we got through that one. Um, thank you for that, you all. I'm pretty sure we're pretty settled for today. I don't know if anyone wants to continue. So with that, I suppose we will see you all next week, and you have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and Shavuot. Thank you.